Hello, welcome to another class of Reaching New Levels of Faith. And I really applaud you for staying with the class for so long, and I hope that you will continue through all 16 of these lessons. These first, really the first half of these lessons, we're covering a lot of the terminology, and to me that's not the most exciting part, but I promise you we're gonna get into more practical stuff where we're gonna be talking about character studies, we look at Peter and Abraham and some of those people in the Bible. And that's really where I think the most progress is going to be made. But just hang in there through some of this description as we're trying to figure out these five levels of faith. And I'm trying to teach you how to figure out where you're at and also how to help somebody else figure out where they're at. And one of the biggest ones is in recognizing affiliating faith. And so this lesson five is on how to recognize affiliating faith. I want to encourage you again, if you can get in front of a Bible, you'll get so much more out of it. If you'll look up these scriptures and read them along with me, you can be turning that Bible to Matthew chapter 6, by the way. We'll be there in a little while. And also, if you can get the workbook, the student workbook, either on a PDF or, or get that ordered and open up those notes and follow along so that you can get the most out of this class. My name is Curtis Hartshorn, minister with the Shakota Church of Christ, and I am really thrilled to be with you today. So let's get into our lesson. How do I recognize affiliating faith? We're talking about that second level of faith. Here's the five levels of faith, imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith, and mature faith. And so it's that second one, affiliating faith, that we want to be able to identify. How do I know if I have affiliating faith and how do I know if others have affiliating faith? In lesson number three, when I was talking about the different levels of faith, I gave you biblical examples of each of the levels and I made this point in there. If you believe what you believe because others believe it, you have affiliating faith. That's the very definition of affiliating faith. It's when your belief is just based on what others believe. It's not really something that you've searched out for yourself. So as far as identifying affiliating faith in yourself, that's easy. Just be honest and ask yourself, do I believe what I believe because others believe it? Because if I do, then I have affiliating faith. But seeing affiliating faith in somebody else is a little more of a challenge. And so I want to show you some identifying characteristics and things to look for in a person that you're working with to see if they have affiliating faith or not. One is, or the first one A, is affiliating prayer. You know, you can learn a lot about someone by the way they pray. I love getting with baby Christians and praying together with them because they just teach you so much. They're often so sincere in the way that they just talk to God, just like they talk to anybody else. But when we have affiliating faith, a lot of times what we do is we just kind of repeat what other people say. We pray exactly the same way as other people that we've been praying with, and that's fine to, to learn that way. But that shows that we are thinking more in an affiliating mindset. We're thinking about, okay, this is what others do, so this is what I should do. Prayer is not something that we've really researched or searched out for ourselves or, or learned necessarily from what the Bible teaches. Another point about prayer is that if, if it's a sincere prayer, then it's not going to be vainly repetitious. In Matthew chapter 6, let me show you what I mean. Matthew 6 is during the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching about prayer. And here's what he says in verse 5. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you... When you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, 
For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many during Jesus' time would use prayer as a way to flaunt their religiosity. They would stand on the corners and say, hey, I'm gather around, I'm getting ready to pray. Here I am, I'm a spiritual person and I'm praying. And, and Jesus says, if that's your attitude, you should go in your closet. Just go and, and just do it there. Because if you're just doing it for people to see, that's the only reward you're going to get is the applaud, the applause of people. He's not condemning public prayer. He's not saying we shouldn't pray together as a group. It's the attitude that he's condemning, this attitude of, of showing off. That's not what prayer is for. But then he says in verse 7, when you pray, don't use meaningless repetition. The Greek word here is badlagnante. It means to say the same thing over and over and over again. Meaningless repetition. You know, it's interesting, after he says, don't do this, don't use meaningless repetition, a lot of people will take what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer there, starting in verse 9, our Father who is in heaven, and they'll memorize it, and they will say it over and over and over again. I grew up in a church where we recited this every time that we had service. Now, one, number one, there's nothing wrong with the prayer. This is Jesus' prayer, and it's a great one. And there's nothing wrong with memorizing the prayer or memorizing any scripture. But to say it over and over and over again, when we're supposed to be communicating with God, that's exactly what Jesus said not to do. Don't use vain, meaningless repetition. If we are sincerely praying, then we're going to pray with, with spontaneity. We're going to talk like we're talking to a person obviously with more reverence because we're speaking to God, but it's more of a personal thing. And the a third point here I want to make is fresh, spontaneous conversation with God happens as we're searching out our relationship with Him. So the closer a person gets to God, the more they're able to speak with Him on a more personal basis. So when we're saying the same thing over and over again, God can tell that we're just, it's not really coming from our hearts. It's other people's sayings. Now, before I go further, let me say something about that. Have you ever had that brother in church that gets up to lead the prayer and you know that prayer so well, you can say it word for word with them. Don't assume that that person has affiliating faith just because they say the same things in prayer. In defense of those who do that, because I've been in that situation, when you are nervous you tend to fall back on what's familiar. And so that's what they're going to do. And that doesn't mean that they have a feeling of faith. It just means that they're probably a little nervous. And so don't, don't pigeonhole people. And all this information that I'm giving you, I hope that you're not going to use it to say, oh, well, there's an affiliate believer over there. Don't pigeonhole people. I'm showing you this so that you can help somebody to grow, not label them. So you can see, okay, well, this is where they're at in their faith. Maybe I can help them to move forward on the searching faith. That's why I'm teaching you this. So, so don't use it that way. And, and be easy on those poor brothers that are getting up to lead the prayer. On the other hand, when somebody is able to overcome that nervousness and they can lead a prayer where they're not repeating the same thing over, over again, something that they've thought through, something that is, that is evolved because of their strong relationship with God, Man, that's a wonderful prayer. Fourthly, affiliate believers lack the confidence that prayer can accomplish something beyond the natural. If you're listening to somebody pray, and generally they pray for things that, to be quite honest, would happen whether we prayed for them or not. 
Lord, bless this food. Well, hopefully we're not going to choke on the food whether we pray about it or not. Uh, Lord, help us to have a safe trip. Yes, it's, it's good to, to ask God to help with stuff like that, but that's generally what people that have affiliated faith, that's what they pray about. When somebody really prays about something that is not naturally going to happen, where God is going to have to intervene either in some unnatural way or through His providence, when you're praying that kind of prayer, it says, Father, I have no idea how this is going to happen. But your word says that we don't receive because we don't ask, so I'm asking. Here's what I'm asking. That kind of prayer takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of faith. It takes a stronger faith than affiliating faith. So when you hear that kind of a prayer, then you are hearing that from somebody who probably doesn't have affiliating faith. It takes a lot of courage. And I'm not talking about faith healing or anything crazy like that. I'm just saying when somebody can pray on that level that they are coming before God with confidence that He can do far more than what people can do. That is not the prayer of an affiliate believer. That is a prayer of somebody who has searched out and owns their faith and they have a good, confident, strong relationship with God. So one way to tell if somebody has affiliating faith is by their prayer life. A second way that you can tell is by the way that a person responds to change. An affiliating response to change, since affiliation is based on what we're familiar with, any kind of change is perceived as a threat or as a danger. It doesn't matter what it is, when a change comes along, if somebody has affiliating faith, they don't want to change anything. Everything needs to remain the same because this is my comfort zone. This is what I, I'm with. Even Number two, even biblically sound changes appears a threat to those who have affiliating faith. In other words, the, the elders can get together and say, now we are, we're examining the scriptures and we're saying if we did this this way, we would uh, do a better job of adhering to what the scriptures say. So this is what we're going to propose. It's the affiliate believers say, oh, no, 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 we can't change that. We can't do that differently. This is the right time to have service, or this is the color of the, of the carpet. That we're, you know, we come up with these silly things just because this is what we're comfortable with. That's a sign of affiliating faith. When you think about it, number three, the Pharisees opposed the changes Jesus was making, even though they were for the good, even though they were in accordance with the will of God. When we look at that passage in Mark chapter 2, I would uh, encourage you to, to flip over there and, and look at, at what Jesus says about change and how people were reacting to the changes he was making during his time. Look at Mark chapter 2 and verse 18. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and they said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, and the new from the old. And a worse tear results. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost in the skin as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Jesus is challenged about fasting. How come your disciples aren't fasting? He says, basically, because I'm still here. Now, I'm going to be gone someday, and then, yeah, the disciples of Christ, they will be fasting. But this is not the time. And then he starts talking about these, these changes that are taking place. And he says, when you, are, when you have a tear in your clothes, 
You don't take new cloth and put it on old cloth and sew it on because then when you get it wet and you wash it, then the new cloth will shrink and the old cloth is already shrunk and it'll make the tear worse. He says you don't take new wine, meaning wine that is not fermented yet, what we would call grape juice. You don't put that in old wine skins because the, the old wine skins have the must in it and then that'll make it ferment and it'll burst the wine skins and you lose the wine and everything is ruined. No, you put new wine into new wine skins. And he's talking about change. Jesus was bringing in a change and they weren't going to be able to take this change, this new covenant, and just pour it into their old covenant ways, even though that's exactly what they tried to do. You say, no, we need to become new wine skins. They were not open to the change because they didn't understand that everything needed to be changed because the old covenant was done away with. It was not effective in taking away sins. Jesus was bringing in the new covenant. By the way, guess what kind of faith the Pharisees had? You might think the Pharisees had really strong faith. They really didn't. They had affiliating faith. Because the Pharisees, they really didn't search out their faith. Now, they were educated. They were trained from the time they were kids. But they were trained by the Tanaim. The Tanaim was the faculty of the, the Jews. And every day they trained in this Tanaim, but they weren't really trained from the Bible. They were trained from the Mishnah, which was the rabbinical oral tri traditions that were passed down orally and eventually were written down. They weren't really taught how to study scripture. They were taught these traditions, these things that were not the book, but books written about the book or ideas communicated about it. Their faith was based on who they associated with. That was affiliating faith. I hope, and I'm putting up here on the screen, the, uh, the example I used in class number three where I was talking about affiliating faith and we looked at the townspeople that the Samaritan woman had reached out to. In this example, the townspeople didn't have searching faith. They weren't directly connected to Jesus. Their faith was dependent upon the Samaritan woman. And because of that, their faith was not able to grow as much as it could because they had not searched out their faith. And I also made the point that the Samaritan woman, her faith was not growing as much as it could, and she was in a position where we commonly see burnout. I want to revisit that for a minute. I, I mentioned this earlier, but burnout is when a person is taking on responsibility that they don't have the spiritual maturity for. Either they never had it to begin with and they're just thrust into this position of authority and they're going to get burned out. Or maybe they had it, but once they're in the position of authority, their faith begins to decrease to a point they cannot sustain, they cannot handle the responsibility that's upon them. And that's where burnout occurs. And I want to mention that to you, this is kind of a side note, but if you're seeing that in somebody in your church, be aware of what's happening. If they're in that position where their faith is waning, but they're in a position where others are dependent upon them to have strong faith, that person's going to be burned, burning out. I've seen it, you've probably seen it as well. So be aware of that in yourself but also in others, uh, we need to try to head that off whenever we might see that. All right, let's talk about the, the third way that you can tell if somebody has affiliating faith. We've looked at a, a person's prayer life and we've looked at their reaction to change. Another way to tell somebody has affiliating faith is by their comments. When you're in a Bible class and you hear somebody making comments, you can tell a lot about a person just by the things that they say. Obviously, an affiliate believer is going to repeat what they hear other believers saying. They hear it and they just go with that. I want to show you kind of a, a comical example in a way in the book of Acts chapter 19 of people just kind of going along with whatever they hear. Acts chapter 19, Paul is in Ephesus. He is preaching the word, but he has some that don't like the message that he's preaching. Verse 23 says, At that time there occurred no small disturbance 
concerning the way. That means there was a large disturbance against the way, meaning the Christians. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, that's Diana, their, their Greek goddess, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. That means they were making a lot of business, a lot of money from this craft. And these he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in also almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there a danger that this trade of ours will fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned of her magnificence. And when they heard this, they were filled with rage, and they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also, some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him, repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. This is just, it's comical how, how all this happened, but you could just picture, here are these people... And they just kind of jump on the bandwagon and they're just saying what everybody else is saying. And they, yeah, a great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Yeah, yeah. You agree too. Yeah. You know, and they're just, they don't even know what they're saying. They don't even, they're confused because they have, they just are, are like sheep. They're just going along with things. Now this is the, the negative side of affiliating faith and, and an extreme example, no doubt. But when we're just repeat things that we hear others say, then there's not a lot of learning taking place. We're just repeating what we've already heard. And you'll hear that in, in the comments of people. They'll say, they'll give the, the pat answers to the typical questions. Well, this is this, and that is that. As we mature spiritually, our speech starts to reflect the wisdom of God's Word. In Proverbs chapter 2, Again, Solomon wrote Proverbs. He says in chapter 2, inspired by the Holy Spirit, verse 1, My son, if you will receive my words, treasure my commands within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice, and he preserves the way of his godly ones. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. When somebody is growing in their faith, they're taking in the knowledge of God, and it's reflective in their speech, in the comments that they make in a Bible class setting, or just as, as you're studying with them individually, the, the way they respond to what you're talking about. Listen to people, and you'll, you'll catch on that here's somebody that probably just has a feeling of faith, or no, this is somebody that has a more, more mature study, a more mature relationship with God, and you can tell that by the things that they're saying. One more warning before we close out, and that is be patient with affiliating faith. You know, growth doesn't happen overnight. You don't just set a goal, okay, right now I'm at affiliating faith, and then next week I'm going to have searching faith, and after that solidify. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It takes time to mature in our faith. But the best time to start working on it is today. 
And I hope that this is encouraging you to want to grow in your faith and to reach that next level. And that's what we're going to talk about next class. In class number six, I want to talk to you about how do I acquire searching faith? Let's say that I agree. Yeah, I have affiliating faith. There's no doubt. I just believe the things I believe because that's what others believe. I want to go on to the next level. How do I do that? I'm going to show you in the next class. Hope that you'll be joining us. Thank you.